Hello, hello. Okay, here we are. Everything settled here. I was actually almost late today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can't wait to tell you all about that. Because that was some crazy stuff right there. But how y'all doing? I'm looking for all of the notifications to come out and for people to start rolling in. Say hello in the chat. Let me know you're here. There she is. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. Choked on a croissant and coughed till I peed myself and needed a shower. Hope your day is better. Um, yeah. <laughs> I didn't pee myself. So there's that. But uh, yeah. Hello, Ava. Lovely to see you. Hello, Cosmopolite. Hello, Kiba. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just start the introduction, and then we will go from there. So hello, 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 everyone. I'm Heather. Uh, my friends and lots of other people call me Nookie. And I have spent the past 15 years of my life um, recovering from an abusive marriage and creating an amazing, loving, and full personal life. Um, I am fortunate enough to be able to write books, uh, teach classes, run workshops um, like this today uh, about love, sex, romance, and kink for people of all genders, relationship statuses, orientations, and more. I have always been curious and adventurous when it comes to how people relate in uh, emotional and physical ways, including sex. And luckily I've had some partners who've been the same. <clears throat> so I have had the opportunity to explore many facets of sexuality in loving and creative ways around the country and around the world. And I've had the opportunity to travel and teach these things as well. Here's the thing. And I know those of you who come to this on the regular are probably sick hearing this, but whatever. All of my experiences thus far, and I mean every single one of them, have led me to the belief that boundaries are the key to not only saving ourselves, but our relationships. They are what take us from getting by or merely average meh, to loving, healthy, strong, passionate, enthusiastic, uh, Twitter-pated, and fan-fucking-tastic. So let's get started. As usual, I'm going to kick us off with an introduction to my book and how I am writing it. So I am currently working on a book, a uh, live title, working title is Boundaries Are Sexy As Fuck, writing it right now. You can get access to the chapters as I write and post them. I think they're like 47 or 50 up right now. Um, by registering right here for my Take No Shit workshop, which is ongoing. It is at your own pace. Um, it is set. It was originally set up to be about seven weeks. Uh, it is actually at your pace um, take each module week at a time. Uh, right now it is a choose your own price with a minimum of $27. Uh, the recommended price is $47. That $27, um, divided by the seven modules that is lower than $4 per module or per week. If you choose to go that route and, um, yeah. And you get the book, you get the live write of the book. So yay. Today is an interesting day because I'm actually, every Thursday, 
um, for the past couple of weeks, I have been doing this live, this public live that you're at right now. And a, um, pardon me, I don't know. Itch. Ah. Um, and right afterwards, I go into a live for my take no shit people. And I'm not sure if you remember, if you're not American, maybe you don't, but last Thursday was a holiday. And so this Thursday I'm doing this live and then I'm going to go and I'm going to go do two lives for uh, last Thursday and this Thursday to make sure that by next week, Thursday, we are caught up with all of the lessons for the Take No Shit Workshop. And, and as I'm going through playing with um, some of the lessons, because I have a tendency to uh, sort of, like I write out the lessons and then as I post them, I kind of rewrite them and I think of inspiration and I change them around and so on and so forth. So I'm futzing with the lessons for today and they are on, coincidentally enough, exactly this topic. The four stages of setting boundaries. And that leads me to why I was almost late today. <laughs> So again, for those of you, hello, Steve, lovely to see you. For those of you who have been following me and are part of the, the Take No Shit class um, workshop and the Boundaries Live, right? You might have noticed that I enjoy uh, sharing little illustrations, silly things, you know, et cetera. Um, so today, I was thinking about uh, an experience that I had uh, just this, maybe yesterday, a couple days ago, um, on Facebook. And I uh, ran into this ad for um, a cat suit. The perfect cat suit. Yeah. The perfect cat suit. And uh, I was writing about it in order to like add a little bit to of story of flavor to these lessons because you know, I like to add in some humor and some silliness and a little bit of um, frippery and so on and so forth. And uh, I was trying to figure out because I, I was thinking how silly the word cat suit is, right? And uh, so I was trying to figure out what I could do with the word cat suit. And I went and I looked and I found a perfect engraving that I'm coloring in because, you know, actually I can actually show you this is hilarious. Uh, that I think, cause I was talking about the perfect cat suit and I'm like, well, what would be the perfect cat suit? <laughs> and um, yeah, there you go. The perfect cat suit. Oh, and wait, you can't see the bottom there. <laughs> the perfect representation of boundaries as a cat suit, <laughs> which that's why I was almost late today is talking about uh, setting boundaries and how it can take practice to set these boundaries. So let's get into uh, setting boundaries, especially the four stages, because again, this is, this is what I'm focused on today. So, um, interesting facts, interesting facts. Uh, I'm not sure if you've noticed this, but things that don't bend break, right? You put enough pressure on something that doesn't bend and it'll break. It's that simple. Um, and things that bend too much don't stand on their own, right? So have you ever tried to like stand a piece of yarn up on its end? No, of course you haven't. Because you're not like in the habit of doing things that are completely useless, right? Because a piece of yarn is too flexible. It's going to bend all over the place. It's not going to stand unless you put like a straw around it or whatever, right? So <laughs> boundaries are kind of like that. 
first of all, like your physical flexibility, Ava. <laughs> yes. Um, what's the joke? Uh, you know, seven years old, you know, fall out of a tree, get up, brush yourself off. I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, 45 years old, you throw out your back, picking up a pencil. <laughs> yeah. Um, so boundaries are not set it and forget it, right? You can't just set a boundary and then leave it forever and ever and ever because you grow, right? You change. The people around you change. Situations change. What might have served you um, when you were younger might painfully constrict you years later, right? Um, so boundaries are like this Facebook ad that I saw, the perfect cat suit. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more um, this afternoon as well. The perfect cat suit. And uh, what is the perfect cat suit? Which is why I had this silly picture of a cat that I was working on. It is second skin, right? It bends with you. You hardly know it's there, and yet it's strong enough to hold you in in all the right places, maybe hide some lumps and bumps that you don't want people to see, to protect you from the elements and from prying eyes, right? And when you wear it, you feel flipping fantastic, and you hardly know it's there, right? So what does the perfect cat suit have to do with boundaries and today's topic of the four stages of setting boundaries. Hmm? It's finding that not too hot, hot, not too cold bit, that perfect space. And the challenge with that is, is that it's really hard to know what's too hot and what's too cold until you've done a lot of testing, right? Like you go into a new, um, a new home or a hotel room and you go into the bathroom and you turn the water spout and you like stick your hand under it. Whew, that's hot, right? And then you like turn it a little bit and you like wait for a second you stick your hand under it oh no a little too cold and you turn uh turn 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 until you get it just right and then you get in the shower and you're in the shower for a little while and then you need to turn it up again right because it's not set it and forget it after you know you have gotten used to um the heat from the first level of hell then you turn it up because you know you're going way to the center in the afterlife and you might as well be prepared now or no wait I'm going way to the center in the afterlife and I might as well be prepared now. That's how I shower. Um, boundaries, right? Practice. And you're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to make some errors. It's going to feel weird. It's going to feel awkward. You're not going to be perfect the first time around. But you're going to try, right? Because like any other skill, it can be learned. It can be practiced. <laughs> yes, Joshua, exactly. Lobster setting. If I don't come out of the shower with my whitest bits, at least the color of my lips, there wasn't enough hot water. <laughs> but here's the thing. People people and people meaning you and I, um, often start tasks that we don't finish, right? Because we don't like to feel awkward and weird. We don't like the experience of doing things that feel uncomfortable, right? We don't like feeling uncomfortable. Feeling uncomfortable makes us well, uncomfortable. So understanding the stages that you're going to go through as you learn to set and maintain boundaries can help 
Because when you're feeling a bit overwhelmed or feeling a bit stuck, you'll know that this will pass. And you'll eventually reach a place where boundaries feel good and they feel natural to you and they feel like the perfect cat suit, right? So today I'm going to share with you the four stages of competency um, as they apply to your boundaries journey, right? So the four stages are, and Celine can probably recite this with me. Stage one, unconscious incompetence. You don't know what you don't know, right? Stage two, conscious incompetence. You're beginning to get an inkling that you don't know a lot of things, right? You know what you don't know. Stage three, conscious competence. You know what you know, but you have to think about it, right? You have to consciously think about what you're doing in order to be competent. And then stage four, unconscious competence. You don't even know all that you know because you have put so much time and effort into it and practice into it that you've become a master, right? Some people say that mastery takes uh, 10,000 hours. I say that as soon as you um, put 10,000 hours on it, you're doing yourself a disservice because one, I've lived for more than 10,000 hours and I would definitely say I'm not a master at life, right? So it's not just the hours that you put in. 10,000 hours of conscious practice, maybe. But some things you're going to pick up faster than others, right? Mm hmm. Womanopolis is here with all of the Socrates, Gladwell. Yeah, actually, I was thinking Robert Greene. I love Robert Greene. Um, hmm. Celine says, I can recite them and did as you said them. Yeah. So let's go through these. Let's talk about these. Un conscious incompetence. This was you sometime before, because the fact that you're here means you're ready to learn. So you are at least in stage two. Hey, that's a step, right? But at one point you were unconsciously incompetent. You didn't know what you didn't know. You had no idea what boundaries were and you just went through life, right? You may have denied even needing boundaries or separation in your relationships. You might've been like, no, we love spending all of our time together. It's like we're attached at the hip. It's so amazing what he does, I do. We're just so close. He doesn't even need any female friends. I'm all he needs. Okay, so that's maybe a bit exaggerated, but you know what? I've actually seen TikTokers that talk like that. So, yeah, unconscious incompetence. Um, this stage is before the moment when you said, something's got to change, right? And you discovered boundaries and decided that you were going to learn more. Stage two. I am not a crook. Yeah. <laughs> Ali says, we literally have friends like that. It is cringe. Cosmopolite has said cringe. Yeah. Yeah, it totally is. Okay. So stage two, conscious incompetence. All right. You, depending on how far along in your journey are, you might be here. You know 
what you don't know. And you're still not very good at all of this, right? You still don't really understand boundaries in this stage, but you do recognize the value of learning and creating good boundary skills. You're probably in this stage or the next stage right now. You're learning, you're taking it all in, you're trying to put it all together in a way that works for you. And in this stage, the conscious incompetence stage, it can be really hard to imagine feeling totally comfortable setting boundaries because you're making a lot of important mistakes, right? Which honestly will help you learn and grow even faster. But you want to progress, right? You want to move forward and you know that there's a lot you can do to move yourself forward. This stage though is the most frustrating because again, you know all the things you don't know and you're beginning to recognize when you fuck it up, right? You're beginning to recognize when you make a mistake, maybe not as, as soon as you're making it, sadly, but afterwards you're like, ooh, I did not get that right. Damn it. Right? Cosmopolite says, I began that phase earlier this year. And Cobalt says, it is a lot of info to apply to a whole life preach. Yeah. Life. Life is a whole lot of info to apply to a whole life. I don't know how we manage it. I really don't. Um, Cosmopolite says, you might even think you get it in this stage. And then you might realize that you don't fully get it yet. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because this is the stage where you're often bouncing back and forth between unconscious incompetence. Like you think you've got it. This is kind of like when a kid learns to ride a bike for the first time and they've just gotten their training wheels off and they're riding with like only one hand on the handlebars. They're like, look, I can do it. Right. And you're just sitting there going, Oh my gosh, they're going to break their skull like a melon. Right. <laughs> and then they fall and they realize, Oh, maybe I don't got it yet. Right. Conscious incompetence. Celine says, I had tons of cringe moments at the start of this phase. And Joshua says, we live and learn, unfortunately, in that order. <laughs> okay, so there's a light at the end of the tunnel, though. Stage three. You'll usually bounce back and forth between stages two and three quite a bit as well. Conscious competence. In this stage... You're setting boundaries and enforcing them consciously. Okay. You've got a handle on the whys and the hows, and you're probably running at about an 80% success rate when you're paying attention. <laughs> um, this is definitely a work in practice stage. And this stage is also the longest stage, or at least it feels like the longest, but it's usually the actual longest. Um, you are aware of your wins and failures here, like to the nth degree. Uh, you'll probably falter and make more mistakes when you're under pressure or when you're running on automatic. And that's pretty common. You can, though, see the improvements and you're fully realizing the benefits. So this stage is actually the stage, interestingly enough, after all of the work getting to it, um, this stage is the stage where most people fail because they stop putting in the practice and the conscious effort and they start to backslide. Um, they start to get to the point where they feel like they know everything because, hey, nothing horrible has happened recently, right? This stage 
is also where most people can pick right back up and start again in nearly the same spot if maybe you left it for a while for something else like oh, i don't know um picking up car parts uh that's actually a bit of an in joke with somebody who's not here right now um but this is where the take no shit workshop is helpful or could be helpful if you use it properly to keep you on track because you have a support system and exercises to help you not only practice more effectively, but see your progress more clearly. So you can work with others. Right. Um, on the bright side for stage three, the people who used to take advantage of you are less and less important to you. You're finding ways to cut them off from harming you. And they're showing they're not so pretty posteriors. So you're seeing them for who they really are. Uh, in this stage also, some of your other friends are noticing the changes in you and might actually, as because they're inspired by you, be taking their own faltering steps into conscious incompetence with their own boundaries journey. And still other friends, some of the really good ones, are applauding and cheering you on. So stage three, that's a big one right there. Um, Cobalt says, so much of living daily is autopilot. Okay, so yes. And let me tell you this, it should be. There are a lot of things in our lives that we should not be thinking about moment to moment because it would take so much brain processing. For example, we should not, as we walk across the room with a glass in our hand, be thinking about how we put one foot in front of the other and maintain our balance and don't spill that drop of water, right? We ought to, in most common situations, be able to do that on autopilot, right? So the idea of these four stages of competence is to get you from holy fudge, I can't do it to, well, from holy fudge, I don't even know what it is, to holy fudge, I can't do it, to holy fudge, this is hard, right? To this is a part of my life, right? Womanopolis says, the Greeks said we already know everything before being born. Eh. I, I disagree with that. Um, I don't think we, I don't think we did. Uh, nope. I disagree. Allie, it seems like I'm in stage three some days and others I fall back into two. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty common as you're, as you're getting things together, as you're learning more things and so on and so forth. It's yeah, it's going to happen. Uh, Cosmopolite says, I feel like I'm in this phase. Yeah. Um, Steve says, conditioning leads us to autopilot. Yes. And that can be either good or not so good. So Cosmopolite says, if you learn, <laughs> trust you to come in with this stuff. If you learn about how our auton <laughs> autonomic, autonomic nervous system works, you'll learn how much stuff we do on autopilot. So much, right? And once you start like digging into your autonomic nervous system, it is fascinating what we can do. And also 
like the good and the bad. Like there are things that we do without thinking on autopilot that are good for us and without thinking on autopilot that are bad for us. And that's where those um, unpacking moments come from, right? Things that like, oh, we had an expectation, it didn't get met. And suddenly we're like, but wait, where did that expectation come from? I talked about that a little bit earlier today in a non-monogamy talk about like, oh, I went from like being this open-minded person to suddenly being married. And for me, that label of married carried entirely different connotations than not married. And I didn't even realize it, right? That's part of how our brains work. They put us on autopilot so that we don't have to think about these things constantly. And yet sometimes it's a really good idea to think about some of these things. Mm -hmm. and Cobalt says, or how to breathe and eat a croissant. Well, I mean, yeah. Cosmopolite, even breathing. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> In through the nose so you don't inhale the croissant flakes. Um, I'm always bringing up the ANS, the autonomic nervous system. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. So for those of you who aren't um, really familiar with the ANS, uh, I if you like science geeky stuff, I absolutely suggest that you go like poke around and do some research into it. Another favorite of mine, and I'm not sure if uh, Cosmopolite is a, a lover of this one, is the um, RAS, the reticular activation system. And that's the part where you say, okay, um, pick out seven yellow things. And you're like, ding, 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 ding. All of a sudden, because all of a sudden, yellow is in your mind. Um, so yeah, our brains are fantastically interesting. And it's one of the reasons that I like to use science and the studies of the brain in um, the Take No Shit workshop and in the Boundaries book to help you get um, an edge over autopilot, survival, threat brain. So <laughs> Roger says the Greeks believed in Zeus, so I'm not sure I trust what they had to say. I mean, yeah, but I mean, as far as gods go, uh, Zeus was, it was a pretty interesting one. Uh, Ava, the marriage scenario I relate to 1000%. And this is the first time I heard someone say it out loud and in a concise structure. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is crazy how I did not, before getting married, examine what I thought marriage was or what it meant to me. And it took me until like I'd been in marriage for years and then out of my abusive marriage to realize like how many strange ideas I'd gotten and not from my parents. Like how I'd picked up these ideas, I don't even know because it wasn't from the people that raised me. Uh, Cosmopolite. It helps for understanding trauma and for understanding why we respond the way we do for the nervous system, 100%. Yeah. Cobalt, I was able to actually diffuse a panic attack in progress the other day with boundaries. Not ending up in a meltdown was such relief. Okay, so let's talk about stage four. Stage four is unconscious competence. You don't know everything that you know, because some of it, you just know, right? Boundaries at this point are second nature to you. You can't explain why you were able to flex this time, but that time you wouldn't, and the situation seem exactly the same, because the processing that's going on in the back of your brain is on autopilot. It's your autonomic nervous system. It is mastery. You are processing a gazillion bits of information and your intuition is honed to the point where you can say, yeah, that's not gonna work for me. So 
I'm going to throw something out there. Uh, Celine, remember, and this could probably apply to like 30 different people. Remember that time you introduced me to this guy you'd been hanging out with for a couple of weeks. And you're like, hey, this is a really like fun, interesting guy. I can't wait till you meet him. He's arty. He takes photos, whatever, right? And you introduce me to him and we have this pleasant little chat. And um, after he leaves, I turned to Celine and I said, I don't like him. And Celine was like, what? Why? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't like him. I'm like, I can't put my finger on it. I just, I don't like him. She's like, whatever. I'm like, you can like him. I'm like, I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't like him. What was it? Like two or three weeks later? It might have been a couple of months later. Um, she does that thing where she calls me up and she's like, hey. And I'm like, hey. And she's like, I hate when you're right. <laughs> and my response to that, my response to that is always to laugh and say, I know. What am I right about this time? And there, there it is. She just, she just said. Um, and a few months later, we found out why. Now, I didn't know that. He hadn't done those things yet. All I knew is that in the back of my head, the processing parts, the intuition, dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig. no, I'm not just keeping him outside my boundaries. I'm keeping him as far outside my boundaries as I can. Right? As Cobalt said, the gut has spoken. And I could not, for love nor money, have told you what in that, what, 15 minutes I talked to that person, why I didn't like them. Yeah. Here's another one, really strange intuition. I'm at a party at a friend's house. It's a big party, like 35 people. And I'm standing like at the front door and out of the corner of my eye, I see like a horrifying monster. Like seriously, this is how my brain interpreted it. A horrifying monster go by. And as soon as I turned to look, it was gone. I'm like, whew, that's weird. And later, as I'm circling through the party, I see the horrifying monster. Only it's not a horrifying monster. It's a man. It's a human. And I was like, but I knew, I knew I'd never met this person before. I'd never interacted with them. But I knew without a doubt that that was the horrifying monster. And I didn't know why. And I asked a couple of people about this person. They were very, very complimentary, very sweet person, you know, always out to help people, whatever, whatever, whatever. And it was uh, a couple of months later, uh, I think it was that um, something awful came out. Like he, uh, beat his partner and tried to commit suicide or he killed his partner and tried to commit suicide or something like that, right? Why did I see a monster out of the corner of my eye? Why did I feel this way about a person I had never met before and never experienced? It's gut. I say it's gut. You know, some people call it the woo-woo. <laughs> I don't call it the woo-woo. I feel scientifically, going back to Cosmopolite, autonomic nervous system. Scientifically, I feel that there are things that we pick up on um, that are not like ESP or anything like that. Um, scent, right? Pheromones, right? The way somebody moves or walks or a glance or body language or whatever. And that gives us a lot of information about people if we choose to listen, right? If we choose to listen. Uh, and I'm gonna look something up here. Um, there is, for those of you, this is a little, little off topic, um, but for those of you who want to strengthen your intuition. Um, I have a link 
I can share with you. And it includes a hypnosis script. There. It includes a hypnosis script uh, that you can listen to. And it includes the written script as well. So you can actually see what I'm going to be saying. So I'm not like, you know, mucking about in your head or whatever. When I went to Thailand in 2018 to learn from a master hypnotist, uh, behavior modification and so on and so forth, a good portion of the beginning of that was um, clearing out our own heads of messes so that when we did hypnotism with and for others, we would not be installing our own flawed neuroses and so on and so forth. And um, this script is a direct result of that. So intuition, if you want to strengthen your intuition. I believe that beginning to set better boundaries is actually what helps you strengthen your intuition in a huge way because you begin to recognize who is and who is not going to push your boundaries, right? And when people feel like boundary pushers, you get the fuck out. You just don't, you don't want to be around them. They have no interest to you. So Ava says the story just gave me chills. Yeah, it was very strange. It was a very strange story. Womanopolis says the eyes tell you everything, except that I can say that I don't always see the eyes. So, I mean, yeah. Cobalt says, I was thinking you could do another to help us learn to get back into safe brain. Hmm. I might be able to right now I'm building some scripts to help me get through the next couple of months, um, for myself, but maybe remind me of that. And then Celine says, I call it personal energy. Yeah. Okay. So unconscious competence. So you've mastered boundary setting and communication. Um, in this stage, people may take you by surprise once in a while, but you're generally quick to correct any holes in your boundaries. You rarely have to think much about your boundaries anymore because there's so much a part of your life and how you interact. Um, in stage four, you've noticed that the people who come into your life are radically different than the people you've attracted before. They tend to be people with amazing boundaries of their own who honor and support yours. And the odd person without good boundaries who makes it into your life in this stage will either grow to match you. You may teach or mentor them along the way when you want to and when you have the resources or they'll drop away because they can't find a good fit with your boundaries, right? And you understand this and you wish them well on their journey. The people who used to take advantage are less and less important to you. And when new people come into your life like that, you're spotting them right away. It seems just like, you know, I don't, I don't like that guy. I don't know why I don't like that guy. I don't like that guy. Your boundaries and your intuition are acting as advanced warning signals and you're trusting them, right? The world is a radically different place for you now. You're living your boundaries day in and day out and you embody everything you've ever wanted in a friend and in yourself. You take responsibility for your actions. You're happy and emotionally balanced overall. You're willing to lend a helping hand when you want to, and you have the resources to do so. You accept compliments, friendships, and love easily. You trust others. And you also see people for who they are, flaws and all. You make the people in your life feel appreciated just 
for being themselves with you. You're able to be kind when telling others that they have hurt you or when disagreeing with them. And you're gracious when others tell you that you've hurt them. You're at peace with where you are in the world, even though you are still growing and improving yourself day by day. And you're living your most full and authentic life to date. Last but not least, you say yes, yes, to others and spend time with them because they matter to you, not just because you think you have to say yes. You can say no just as easily, but you choose to spend time with people. And while you uh, probably have so many other ways that you want to grow and change and explore the world, when you're at this point with your boundaries, you know that the possibilities are endless because if you can consciously bring yourself to stage four, unconscious incompetence with boundaries from where you were, if you can do that, you can do anything, right? And you can do that. I promise you this. You absolutely can do that. Celine says, I find now that I'm drawn to people who have good boundaries and I'm here for that. Hell yeah. yeah. Womanopolis says, I fear people that have intense gaze. I think that's really interesting. I'm trying to think how I react. I don't think I, I don't think I really, I mean, I might think, Ooh, that person's really intense, but I think I could be just as easily intrigued as fearful. So I guess I would ask, were I in your shoes, I would ask myself, why do I fear them? And is that fear always justified? Cobalt, is it ever hard to recognize when you dodge a bullet since it's less dramatic than taking it? Yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, there's definitely been times when I'm like, I don't like that person. Hmm. Or, you know, like I shy away from getting deeper with people or whatever. And I see other people like seemingly having a fabulous time with them or whatever. And I'm like, hmm, maybe I was wrong. But I have every once in a while second guess myself like that. And then I realized that, ooh, I was right the first time around. So I don't do that really anymore. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, good for them. I didn't really get a good vibe off of that person. Oh, well, right? Allie, sometimes intimidation can be confused with fear. Maybe that's what it is at Womanopolis. Sure, intimidation. I mean, intense people can certainly feel psychically intimidating. Um, especially when you're a less intense person, right? I know that, you know, at the level that I tend to operate at. I, you know, so, okay, so here's a story. So Celine, long, long time ago, asked me to help her run a kinky venue. And I said, no, absolutely not. There is no way, not gonna do it. She's like, but why? Tell me why I want you to run this venue with me. You would be perfect. And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna do it. And she badgered me. This was, it was, it was consensual badgering. I let her badger me, but I wasn't going to do it. And the reason I wasn't going to do it is because I felt that being who I am, a very strong dominant personality with a lot of opinions, going into business with a submissive personality who ultimately 
constantly pretty much wants to please me and make me happy would be really bad for her. Ultimately, we figured it out and um, we did run a venue together and we did it well. And uh, she is helping me run, you know, Dating Kinky and Curiouser. So ultimately, we figured out how to make that work. And I figured out how to tone down some of the intensity that I offer. And um, I don't think she's ever actually been intimidated by me, although lots of people have for various reasons that I don't completely understand. But um, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of things to go through and unpack. So Womanopolis says, no intimidation. There's people that have threatening faces. Um, yeah, I mean, there, so going back to my much younger years, uh, I took off hitchhiking in my teenage years and joined the carnival. And I ended up traveling with carnies. I turned 16 in the carnival. And um, there were a lot of men, because I was literally the only girl um, and the youngest, there were a lot of men who were very threatening, physically threatening, uh, facially threatening to others, um, that I was perfectly comfortable around. They were big teddy bears to me, right? So I think that a lot of what we find threatening or non-threatening or whatever, especially when it comes to very specific things that we can put a rule on to, um, is based on what we've experienced in our life. Cobalt says, I've been told I can have very intense eyes. There you go. So, I'm going to have to close this up in about eight minutes, actually a little bit sooner so I can rush to the bathroom and get some more water and so on and so forth. So I can get on to my take no shit workshop. And in the take no shit workshop today, we are going to be talking about what are we doing today? We are talking about, ah, we're going to talk about uh, planning making a plan um, to avoid backsliding in your boundaries. That's what we were working on last week. Um, I'm going to give everyone a come to nookie about practicing. And then for this week, we're going to talk about um, a little bit about these four stages of boundary setting, although because I've just talked about it now and it's going to be in the library, I'm going to let them read and um, watch this replay. But I'm going to talk about the beginner master conundrum. Now, I'm sure a lot of people have um, heard about uh, how difficult it can be for somebody who's done things, who've mastered things to teach somebody who is new um, and to even think about the things that new people would even be thinking about because the brain is so far along. Well, I've got some interesting science to bring out and share with you about rules and boundaries and why we're setting them and what it's going to mean and how this is all going to work together with the four stages of setting boundaries to help you realize the progression that you're going to go through and um, probably understand a lot of the contradictions you're going to see in yourself and in the world around you and in conversations about boundaries as you grow. And I'm really excited about that because I get super geeky about like this sciencey shit. So Steve says, as an ex-cop, do I intimidate others without realizing it? I mean, that's the thing. Like, I sometimes intimidate others without realizing it. And look at me. I'm just like, 
I'm a 49 year old woman who looks like I could have a couple of kids and be a soccer mom. You know, I got a couple colored streaks in my hair, but I'm not a very intimidating person. Oh, and speaking of in the take no shit lessons that we're going to be doing here in just a few, I'm also going to talk a little bit about this boundaries conversation that I've been having. Now, those of you in the boundaries live, right. And in the take no shit workshop know a little bit about this. Whereas this, this, what boundaries are post going around the internet. And I have lots of opinions about it, including the difference between boundaries and ultimatums and why communication makes a difference. So Allie, um, I just signed up for the workshop today. Will I be able to view the live? The countdown at the bottom of the page confused me. You should be able to view the live. Um, did you get your email? Because if not, real quick, um, shoot an email. Actually, shoot a text. Let me give you, let me give you the new number for um, Curious, sir. Oops. I'm going to the wrong place. I have to look it up because I don't have it memorized yet. Uh, so um, 919-299-1108. Pop that in there and I'll put it up on the screen. There you go. Let me double check that. 919-299. Okay, there you go. If any of you have any questions, need any help, whatever, that is this right here. That is how you reach out to us. And if necessary, Ava, we will make sure, or uh, Ava, Ava just posted, Allie, we will make sure to get you that link. So you can get in and see the live and get you set up immediately. But I have three minutes. Thank you all. I love you. Um, I put this in there one more time. Do, 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 do. There we go. That's how you get signed up for the live write and the take no shit workshop. And thank you all. Next Tuesday, I will be back at noon Eastern time. I'm not sure right now what the topic is because I'm running a little late. You know how I am. I usually run over for these things. So I'm going to kiss y'all goodbye and I'm going to go potty and I'm going to get some water. And then I will see everybody in the take no shit workshop in just a few moments. Thanks.